Yedidi V'chavivi, Rabbi Yenis said that to run an organization you have to start on time. In rabbinics you have to finish on time. So I hope it's the Atta Deshmaya to finish on time. Bereshus Achai V'reyai. Pesach Sheni is a time when Yidin said, Loma Nigora. Why should we be prevented from bringing a Koban Pesach? From being part of Klal Yisrael? And until this very day, the overwhelming majority of Klal Yisrael. <coughs> is silently <clears throat> crying out Lomani Gola. Why should we be <clears throat> prevented from joining Klal Yisrael? Lag Boimer is a day that celebrates the cessation of death. A very strange Yom 24,000 Talmidim Rabbi Kiva died, a terrible Misa, Askara, and they were not destined to be the disseminators of Torah. Why celebrate the fact that they stopped dying? Commemorate it in some way, but to make a yomtif out of it? <coughs> Truth be known, it's very difficult to comprehend the Talmidim of Rabbi Kiva. Rabbi Kiva's clarion call what you despise, don't do to another. How could it be that even a Shemetz of the essence of Rabbi Kiva did not influence his Talmidim? 24,000 Ga'ine Hador Tanoim that weren't influenced by the Rebbe's existence, his raison d'etre. What you despise, don't do it to another. And then that know you covered Zebaze. It's very difficult to comprehend. There's another Gemara. And the Gemara says that Rabbi Kiva Paskin's halacha lamaisa of survival of the fittest. <clears throat> Rabbi Kiva says that if you're in the desert, sojourning with another and you possess the only flask of water and you only have enough water either for yourself or your friend you'll divide it you'll both die and the question is do you give it to your friend do you take it for yourself Rabbi Kiva Paskins La Lachi your blood is of no lesser value than your friend and you drink the water and you survive and you live and whatever happens to your friend, that's the Ashkoch of HaKadosh Baruch That's how Rabbi Kiva Paskin, the Allah Your survival is more important than someone else's survival. The Talmidim of Rabbi Kiva understood that Torah was the Samachayim. That Torah was the elixir of life. Torah was in their lifeblood. They lived Torah, they breathed Torah, they slept Torah. How are they going to give up their lifeblood? By reckoning with somebody else's svare, his understanding of the tzayis and the sivas, the rajba, how he learns pshat in a mishnah and a rashi, they're giving away the last flask of water. So remembering the lesson of Rabbi Kiva, they didn't give it away. They didn't give quarter. They didn't accept or tolerate anybody else's understanding of the blat gemara. It was their way or the highway. So ultimately, they were not able to be mechabit somebody else's blat gemara, his insight, his ashkafe, his mesaira. Because if there's one ketun of mayim, the elixir of life, the tayrak daisha, you don't give it away. But at the end of the day, they could not be the disseminators of Torah. Because the lesson that we're to learn from the demise is that the survival of Torah is by giving it away. The survival of Torah is by reckoning with someone else. 
This is Disneyland, Rabbi Yisai, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, to have Hasidim, Charedim, Litvisha, doctors, lawyers, dentists, Rabbonim, Tamidei Chachomim, Choshev and Noshim Tzidkanias, all gathered for one purpose. This is how we're repairing the torn fabric. This is a celebration of Sfira. This is Lag Ba'imer, the resiliency of Klal Yisrael. The fact that Rabbi Kiva took five more Talmidim from the south, and the Torah that we have today are from all those Talmidim, one of the premier Talmidim, of Shimon Ba Yechoya was nifted on Lag Ba'imer, so it represents the resiliency of Klal Yisrael. The tenacity of Rabbi Kiva, who didn't throw back the keys to HaKadosh Baruch in frustration and say, take back your Torah, you killed all my Talmidim. He started again. If the Churban Europa, the Jews who arrived at these shores, didn't say, Rabbi take back the keys. They raised, Deireis Yeshara Mivayrochim, Kashrus Taos Mishpache Shabbos, love for each other, building Meistis HaTayra. And those Jews that were here during the Holocaust of American acculturation and assimilation in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, they were mice and effish. They never gave up. And the result is this august body of Yireim Ushleimim who are here to be inspired and to inspire others. Who learned the lesson of the death of the Tamidim Rabbi Kiva, that it's necessary to give up for others. Rabbi Yitzhak Mivulki, we just read in the Pausha of Yohaftal Yachakamaycha, who doesn't want to love another Jew? What's mean to us to love another Jew? <clears throat> I love you, I love you, I love you. And then your child steps on my toe as he's leaving the aisle, and I don't look at you for six months. Rabbi Yitzhak Mivurki says if you want to learn about the Ahavta Racha Kamecha, it's Pora Aduma. Pora Aduma is miyusid on the after Racha Kamecha. Very strange and puzzling statement. <coughs> Pora Aduma, the very same ashes of the Pora Aduma that purify the individual who's tame, defile the Kayan who prepares the ashes, who sprinkles the ashes. Umbaze me'ani the Yechabes begodov. Where do you learn the after Racha Kamecha from there? I believe the terrace is glaring, and it's what we're all about, every one of us in this room. The Kayan has been trained since his earliest youth to remain with the status of Kedusha Vitara, of purity and sanctity. He refrains from becoming Tomei. His Rebbe, his Rav, his Rosh Hashiva, his Shver, his Zayda, his uncle, his Nifter, he can't go to the Leviathan. His brother-in-law, his sister-in-law, only the immediate relatives, father, mother, sister, brother, son, daughter, spouse. And his whole life he abstains from Tume Kumta Zulik, a fellow who's not really cognizant of what's happening in his life. Becomes spiritually defiled, Tume with corpse Tume. He touches a mace, and now he's Tume. And this Heilige Koyen, loses his status of Tahara to be Metar Yena, he becomes Tomei, that's the Aftar That's the Yisoy of Yitzhak Mivoki. That's real Aftar Rachamecha. It doesn't mean you're over Averis. It's according to the getter of the Torah. But both Rav Moshe and Moran Rav Yankiv, Moran Rav Moshe said independently that the same way there's something called Maisik Safim, a year has an obligation to give 10%, 15%, 20% of his earnings to the indigent, to the poor. There's a chiv in our door to give meiser of your zman. If you're going to learn 100 hours a week, then 10 hours have to be to the indigent and the poor. If you're going to spend 10 hours learning, then an hour has to be given. That's why you're here, preaching to the choir, so to speak. I don't just mean the group up there, I'm talking about everyone. Because at the end of the day, you realize that to enrich yourself, you have to enrich Klal Yisrael. That we have an achrayas.
and dafki bimeasfira. That's the ultimate tikkun and takona. Specifically during these days. <coughs> to create the nitzchis of Klal Yisrael. You gathered here, Leroy's for Leroy's, to see and to be seen. In a nutshell, if I needed to typify each and every one of you, your begeda, Gavra Rabba. Was meant us a Gavra Rabba. The Gemara says in Besech the Marcus on the Avchofen with Beis, Oma Rova Kama. Tipshoi hani inshi the kami mikama sefatera, or the kami mikama gavred rabba. There was an encounter between the Ostrovtsa Goyen, the Ostrovtsa Rov, and Reb Chaim Oize, Rabban Shel Kol Bnei Agoyla in pre-war litter. And Reb Chaim Oize turned to the Ostrovtsa and asked him for a chiddush tayra. He was a brilliant mechadish, and he said to him, "Why are you asking me for a chiddush? You're a gavred rabba." So Reb Chaim Oizah, why am I a greater Gavar Rabba than you? He said, the Gemara says, Oma Rova, Kama Tipshoi Sharinchi, the Kami Mikama Gavar Rabba, Vala Kama Mikama Sefer Torah. How foolish are those individuals, the Kama Mikama Sefer Torah, they stand for a Sefer Torah, but they don't stand for a Talmud Chacham. Because in the Torah it says, Aboyim Yakenu, and the Rachamim came and lessened the 40 to 39. Person transgresses his Eva Alisa say, with Hasra, with warning, he eats the other white meat, he gets malchus. The Torah says, Our boy, Yakenu, you should get 40 lashes. The Chachamim came and they took away a lash. According to the Chadusha Ramban, Oifenot, and the Gemara Makis, they actually qualified Dvar They changed it from 40 to 39. And the Gemara is referred to the Tamid Chachamim who did that as Gavar Rabba. Continue the Ostrovtsa. There are other places where the Chachomim qualified Vartaira. It says, Tis Baruch Hamishim You have to count 50 days of Svira. Lamaisa, we only count 49 days. Minyan Amevili de Mizbach Hamishim. So why is that not Gavarabba? Said the Ostrovtsa, because there they're teaching Allah how to count Svira. That's very important. But in Mesech the Makis, When Chachamim turned the punishment, the Einish of 40 lashes into 39, what they did is they took away a clap from a Yid. They lessened the severity of his punishment. That's Gavar Rabba. To lessen pain and suffering of another Jew is a Gavar Rabba. To know Shas is not yet a Gavar Rabba. But to take away pain and suffering, even a minuscule amount from another Yid, does say the Gavar Rabba. And you, Reb Chaim Oiz, are renowned not just to be a Goyen in Taira, but your whole life is to take care of Agunas and Yisoyim and Almonis, widows, orphans, those that are abandoned, to restore life to them and dignity to them. You're a Gavar Rabba, you're a towering personality. You don't need to hear Taira from me, I need to hear Taira from you. Every Maisa that we hear, you have to learn up like a Lamdin. If you look at Mesech Lamakis, it describes at the end of the third parak how Malkus lashes are administered. It's a whip that's made of braided calfskin with donkey hide. It's extremely painful. The Shliach Tzibur expends all his energy in whipping the individual and flogging him. After three Malkis, you forget your name. After nine Malkis, you don't know what planet you're on. So what's the difference if you get 40 lashes or 39 lashes? You're faklap daishana. Your back is cut to ribbons and you're in terrific pain. <clears throat> so why are you a Gavar Rabba Chachamim by taking away one lash? The man's still writhing in pain. As the Christ the Territ says that if you take away a minuscule amount of pain, you're a Gavar Rabba. We live in an instant society with instant solutions. We want instant popcorn, instant soup, <clears throat> instant relationships. We want to resolve problems instantly. We don't get involved because we can't fix the problem. Who says you have to fix the problem? A Gavra Rabba takes away your little pain. A Gavra Rabba learns an hour with another Yid. A Gavra Rabba picks up the telephone, writes a letter or an email. 
sanctioned, of course, by Agdal. A Gavarabba does what has to be done to love another Yid through teaching him Torah. That's what this is all about. <clears throat> You're giving up your time and you understand that in reality, Yiddishkeit is all about sharing what we have. That's the authentic way to transmit the Torah. That's the derech. And that's what we celebrate in Lagba Ima that there were five new Talmidim. Unfortunately, Talmidim Rabbi Kiva were not right to transmit the Torah because they lacked this essence of understanding the need to share someone else's Torah, to share their Torah with others. How can they transmit the Torah? The Nogu covered Zebazeh. It's a Kitun Shamayim. It's a flask of water. I need it for my own survival. But the next five Talmidim, the Talmidim that transmitted the Torah understood. If you steig, I steig. The Arevis, the Ziskeit, Kikol Orev. Concept of Arevis means the Torah is so gishmak that I pass it on to others because I want to share the, share the sweetness with others. I want to leave you with two stories. One story happened on Shabbos HaGadol. I told the Gabbai who asked me if I was speaking Shabbos morning, 24 years in the Rabbanis, Shabbos HaGadol, Megit HaDrosh HaGadol Vanoira, you don't give a drosh in the morning. So he asked me, is the Rav speaking? I said, yeah. He says, about the decorum? I said, no, I want to speak about something positive. So I told the Olam the following Misa. For 10 months I had been staying at my cousin's house. We recently moved into our home on Bedford and Obach Hashem, but we were staying in our cousin's house. For the last Shabbos, we're staying there, Shabbos Sagodol. I walk out the door with my Rebbe Tzimah Rebela and I see a Mercedes Benz parked in front of the house. Now, this did not happen in Minneapolis, in Milwaukee, in Denver, in San Francisco, it happened right here in Flappish on Avenue N between East 16th and East 17th. Black Mercedes Benz is stuck. Lights are flashing. Guys cranking the engines to gate nicht. And I walk by, I see a handsome Italian fellow, youngish guy, about 28 years old. And he's cranking the car. And I just smile. He's blocking the driveway. He's in front of the hydrant. He rolls down his window and he says, it's not a very good day. So I tell the Italian guy, hopefully it'll get better as the day gets on, goes on. So he responds to me, Shabbat Shalom. So I figured out right away, because I'm a Brooklyn boy, this isn't an Italian. This is like a Sephardi fellow. He looks like an Italian. He's a handsome fellow, but he's, he's Jewish. So we're walking to shul, and after three blocks, I like to be on time. I tell my rabbits, then, you know, this is Hashkocha Protis. That his car should get stuck bedafka in front of the house that we're staying at for 10 months, the last Shabbos that we're here, we're moving before Pesach into the new house. And his mazel is stuck right in front of the rabbi's house. There's something to this. And he smiled when he said, Shabbat Shalom, I gotta go back. So she says, I was thinking of it, but I knew you were gonna be late. Let's go back. If you feel we should go back, let's go back. So I go back to the car, and the man's on the phone. And I turn to him, I say, you know, it's Shabbat today. And you look like a nice guy. I know it sounds crazy, but there's got to be a reason why you got stuck in front of the rabbi's house. And I punk walked out as you're there, and punk, you tell me Shabbat Shalom, and it's the last Shabbos that I'm here. Come with me to shul. He looks at me like I'm crazy. I said, Tavoy Tila Beta Knesset. We'll go daven together. You'll sit near me. You'll come home. You'll come back. I'll give you some Cholom Chamin. He knew what that was. The man gets out of his car, pushes his car to the curb so he's not blocking traffic on Avenue N. I tell him, leave your stuff in the house. Comes into my cousin's house takes his cell phone, his wallet, his car keys, his money, and he puts it on the shelf. What I didn't know was for hours his phone's ringing, and my cousin thought I left my phone in my coat pocket on. He didn't know whose phone it was. 
The man was on the phone with the tow truck driver. I said, forget about the tow truck. It's raining. I tell him, you want a coat? I don't need a coat. I was in the Israeli army. He tells me his story. He grew up in Syria, Damascus. And he left when he was 15 years old, like in 1990-something. And a whole mafis happened there. I'm not going to get into the whole story. So I'm walking with him. I ask him what his name is. He says, Chaim. Well, it was Mavarcha Machaydish. I said, Chaim Shal. No, it wasn't. Shabbos was Agol. Chaim Shal Torah. Chaim Shal Ava. I'm joking with him. And we had a whole shmuzerai. And we came to Shul. And one of the Balabatim took him and sat him right next to him, right in the front of the Shul. So he's in front of the Bima. And all the people are behind. They don't see him. The kids and Nimrods, I tell the, the Gabi I'm going to talk. And I get up and I tell the story about this fellow. His name is Chaim Luz. I told him Luz. He tells me in Ar Arabic, Luz means almonds. I say Luz to us is the bone, the Luz, that's the neck bone. And it never disintegrates. And it remains firm and strong. In fact, after I said this Barabim, somebody came to me and said that their uncle was in the Sander Commando. And he was sweeping up ashes for months of all those that were cremated. And time and time again, the loose bone always remained intact. The loose bone always remained intact. And I told Chaim Luz on the way to Shul that the loose represents the tenacity of Klal Yisrael and the resurrection with Chiyas HaMesim. A body is formed from the loose. Malavam Alki, eat to strengthen the loose bone is brought in the Gemara. I'll call upon him, so I get up and I tell the island the story. And then I say, by the way, the young man in the story is sitting right here in the front. His name is Chaim. Let's greet him. I said, Chaim, stand up. He's a shy fellow, didn't want to stand up. Finally, after three times he stood up, hundreds and hundreds of people gave him a standing ovation. They got out of their seats. I didn't tell them to do this. And they gave him Haitzov and when we were coming home from shul, the whole Flappish community had heard about it. And people were coming over to me, and I was introducing him to the Gantz Havelt. He told my son afterwards, he felt like he was a Hollywood movie star. And then he stayed in the home. I made Kiddush, Hamaitzi, he had Sholent. And about 2.30, I went up to take a nap before my shear. And when I came back, he was gone. The Mercedes was gone. But do you hear the incredible Mr. Asnefesh of a young man? He's willing to throw his whole life away. He manages a store on Utica Avenue. The store didn't open up that day. His wife was trying to get a hold of him. Nobody, he disappeared from the face of the planet from 8.30 in the morning till after 3. Story's not over. We almost had his wife here at the event today. Couldn't work it out logistically. But she almost came with my Rebetzin this morning because I wanted to introduce her to you. She's not a punch to the lady. She grew up in Boston. And she wrote a beautiful letter to my wife and sent over a bottle of wine. I've been praying for this moment, she said. Rabbi said, I could have just kept on walking. It's not my nature. I was a rub in Minneapolis. I don't do this for a living. Nothing better to do but tell a guy, come with me to shul, leave your car, your keys in my house, and you'll go home by 3 o'clock. But they're waiting for this. There's a Maisa Shahoya. Now I'll conclude with another Maisa Mr. Isaac Gross told me last night. He learned in Chassan Soifer, and there was an elderly Yid who drove the school bus in Chassan Soifer, picked him up every day, brought him back home. Man's name was <clears throat> Shlomo Katz, Mr. Katz. When Shlomo Katz could no longer drive the school bus, he wanted to still be involved in Matasdorf, some Soifa. So he took it upon himself every day to pick up the Matasdorf Rov and to bring him to Shul and to bring him to the mikveh and help him into the mikveh and out of the mikveh. The Alta Matasdorf Rov is a Chetzadi Vekarish Tovrach. And when the Matasdorf Rov was Nifta, he asked permission to take care of the mikveh. Shlomo Katz wanted to clean the mikveh. Keep it orderly. Rabbi Shleim Katz was nifter, sitting on the steps of the mikveh. Isaac Gross was at his funeral. 
At his levaya, his wife had a big, a big brown big. And his wife says, I want to bury this with my husband. My husband wants us buried with him. And so the Hainta Gematis of Arov, the Tzaddik, asked her, what's in the bag? She opened up the bag. Hundreds and hundreds of scraps of soap, the little bars of mikveh soap. This was the soap that he used to use to wash and scrub the matas door of his back before he went into the mikveh, to help clean the matas door for Rav. And he wanted this soap buried with him to be a schus, to be made, that he took care of the matas door for Rav, that he bathed them and washed them and showered him hundreds and hundreds of times. So they tried explaining to his wife that she can't bury the soap in the cave and she started crying and screaming. And the Heintika matas door for said, I guarantee you, the matest of Rav Zatzal is now being macabre, pun him, your husband. He doesn't need this soap. Rabbi said, that's why you're here. Every one of you is taking soap and washing our people and preparing them with the soap of Torah, of Yira, of Chesed. And Akrimei of Esrim Shana, these individuals, Bechayim loses their parents, their grandparents, their great grandparents. Avram Yitzhak and Yankiv are going to greet you and they're going to say, You washed my child's back. You brought him back to Yiddishkeit. You were Mechazakim in Torah and Mitzvahs. You recognize that you're not clean unless he's clean. That you're not Mechayim, the Chiv of Kiddush, until every Jew has made Kiddush. That's the concept of harvest, according to the Acharonim. I'm not being might see somebody else with his chiv, it's my chiv. Ashreichem. You're an incredible group of Yireim Ushleimim. You're following Rav Moshe and Rav Yankiv and it's Sadiqim and Gedolim and Rabbi Kiva who recognize the need to share that flask of water when it comes to Torah with others. Kaddish Baruch Hu should be mated. This Knesia should be one L'Shem Shemayim of Ribuik Kvayt Shemayim. You should walk away inspired to inspire others. <clears throat> I'm inspired by the massive turnout. You know, sometimes in the Yiddish Welt, you say 9.30, bid the yuk, biz the yidden velen kumen. You know, normally the 10 to 10 slot is not a minion. And generally it's your own relatives. But for the Olam to come out and mass, to learn how to teach, to learn how to grow, to grow through others is nothing more incredible than this. You don't need to be an outreach professional. I am certainly not an outreach professional. The person says Shabbat Shalom, you respond. We will have so many opportunities to do this. should be to grow, to inspire yourselves and others. In this chus will truly celebrate Pesach Sheni Loma Nigora. We'll celebrate the continuity of Taira on Lag Ba'ima. And we'll be Zaikha to the greatest Simcha Bhaviya Sagar Mervi Amenu. Amen.